RSC Advances is the RSC's largest journal. It's also the largest open access chemistry journal in the world at the moment. In 2018, we had submissions from over 80 countries and we published articles from over 60. We've got about 100 associate editors from over 30 countries across the world. So we're really a global community publishing in all areas of the chemical sciences. The main advantage of RSC Advances is the fact that it's open access. Once you publish that paper, anyone around the world can access that paper and read it. We really make sure that um, our authors get high quality reviews and we try to get our papers to publication as quickly as possible. So we think we offer a, a very good service. We have an exceptional team of associate editors who work closely with the research community who solicit reviews from trusted reviewers uh, to help evaluate work. The first important thing about submitting a paper is ensuring that you have a really good cover letter that clearly explains you know, the novelty of your approach and the advancement of the science, because that is the first thing the editor is going to read. For authors who, who want to submit to the RSC, my major advice would be the same advice I give my PhD students. Keep it simple, keep it focused, and really make sure that you're providing the evidence, the scientific evidence, to support your hypothesis. I think one of the things that sets the RSC apart from other publishers is that it's really more of a family-type community. The RSC is not this behemoth publishing entity I think one of the things that I have found refreshing is how they really try to engage uh, the younger scientific community as well in all aspects, not just in publishing, but in terms of board membership, uh, in terms of the types of symposia that they support, and the ways in which they try to support diversity and inclusion. The RSC is a society publisher, and that means that it has its members at its heart, it has its authors at its heart and it puts back into the community. So I would recommend RSC Advances um, because of our open access model. I think open access is very important for disseminating research, for reaching your colleagues and your collaborators, and RSC Advances has really pioneered the use of open access. I think we'd really like to engage as many people working in chemistry as we can, really get people excited about open access publishing, and making sure that people have access to as much of the chemical sciences research as they can. Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the sixth West seminar. Uh, today we have Isabella Schlufaska from the University of Win Wisconsin Madison and Arben Jasufi from ExxonMobil. Um, this is the final seminar in the 2020 series. Uh, we do plan to be back in 2021. Um, we'll keep you posted about that. Um, just before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Royal Society of Chemistry, Swiss Tribology, the Institute of Physics and the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Um, so first of all, Isabella's um, going to talk about chemical and microstructural evolution in tribological contacts. Um, Isabella, if you could please share your screen. Okay. Okay. Can you yes. see my slide? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, take it away, Isabella. Okay, great. Well, thank you and um, very much for inviting me here to present my work. Um, uh, the title of my talk is Microstructural Evolution of uh, Frictional Contacts. And uh, today I would uh, like to focus on the idea that uh, materials and interfaces and sliding contacts are not static. Uh, they evolve. And uh, the properties, uh, the friction and wear in these contacts depends on the properties that materials have while the contact is moving. So it is really important to understand uh, the, uh, these properties, but it's challenging uh, because we're dealing with uh, buried interfaces under highly non-equilibrium uh, conditions. And there are two aspects of this evolution that I believe are important and we are focusing on uh, in my group. Uh, the first one is uh, chemical evolution of interfaces. 
uh, we have currently a limited understanding of what chemical reactions take place and these buried, uh, uh, these buried interfaces and how they couple to uh, how they are coupled to stresses and forces. For instance, long-range elastic fields. Another aspect of that is uh, um, the microstructure. Uh, the uh, microstructure that develops near the sliding interface in the tribal layer is often quite different from the original material and from the microstructure that exists far away uh, from the sliding uh, material, from the sliding interface. And so the traditional structure property relations that we know from materials are here of limited use under these uh, dynamic, highly non equilibrium conditions. And for example, it is recognized that materials that develop this uh, nanocrystalline layer near the sliding interface uh, are generally, uh, have generally better wear resistance than materials that do not. Uh, and this is because nanocrystalline materials are often harder and stronger than their polycrystalline or microcrystalline counterparts. But again, there's a lim limited understanding of uh, how this microstructural evolution takes place and how can we control it? How can we design materials that have these uh, desirable properties. So if I was to summarize uh, what's needed, where I believe it's important in the field is that uh, we need to understand and discover these mechanisms of both microstructural and chemical evolution uh, in order for us to be able to design strategies and design new materials with superior tribological uh, uh, properties and performance. And to aid that uh, discovery, uh, we need uh, multi-physics tools computational tools that can be very helpful to understand what happens, happens at these buried interfaces that can capture uh, the uh, complexity of physics that's happening in sliding contacts. So let's say chemical reactions, highly accurate uh, description of chemical reactions and coupling to this long range elastic fields in rough contact at multiple scales. And it's also important to develop and apply advanced experimental techniques that are capable of monitoring this evolution uh, in operando. And so because of the limited time today, I decided to focus on microstructural evolution. Uh, but uh, if uh, there's an interest in chemical evolution, I'm more than happy to talk to uh, uh, people offline. And so I'll uh, use an example of aluminum alloys here to show you how we go about understanding the evolution of a microstructure. Aluminum alloys are, uh, have many excellent properties and I use in many applications already. Uh, for instance, they have a high strength to weight ratio, they're light. Uh, they have good corrosion resistance, so they develop this alumina layer that's protective uh, for corrosion and many other properties. But the problem with aluminum is that it has poor tribological performance. And you can see here on this plot on the right hand side, uh, this is the wear rate. Uh, the dark gray color corresponds to aluminum. And you can see that the wear rate in aluminum is just much higher than in other metallic systems, let's say in steel. So the question is, how can we improve uh, wear resistance of this, uh, of this type of material? And so there are different strategies. And one of them is to uh, decrease the grain size of the material to the nanometer regime. And I alluded to this earlier. Nanocrystalline material is often stronger and harder. And this strategy actually has worked uh, in, uh, in aluminum too. So here on the left-hand side, you can see a plot of the wear loss um, for nanocrystalline aluminum. This is experimental study. And you can see that the material with a smaller grain size has a better, uh, lower wear uh, loss, better wear uh, resistance. So you can say, well, okay, this is great. We solved the problem. But the issue is, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, the material that we're dealing with to begin with is not the same material that's going to, is not going to stay stable during sliding. And in fact, this is one of the issues with uh, aluminum alloys that uh, in a number of studies, they have been shown to exhibit uh, stress-induced or wear-induced grain growth. And this is detrimental to the wear resistance. Here's just an example uh, of a study showing TEM image of uh, aluminum with 500 nanometer grain size before sliding and after sliding. And you can see uh, uh, that in this tribal layer, there's a substantial grain growth uh, that occurred. And in fact, uh, the wear resistance of the, of the material has decreased during this process. So why is this an issue in aluminum alloys? So this is, aluminum is an example of a metal that has a high stacking fill energy. And what it means is uh, in practice that it's difficult to introduce uh, dislocations that are stable in these small grain size materials. And these dislocations are necessary to see continued grain refinement. So um, 
we ask the question whether it's possible to develop strategies to uh, suppress green growth in aluminum or similar high stacking fold uh, energy metals. And so today I'd like to talk about three strategies that we employed. employed. One of them is related to the sliding conditions, so it's the external uh, conditions. And uh, the second and the third are related to the synthesis. How can we use synthesis to improve the wear resistance? And I'll talk about the effects of alloying elements and as well of effect as the effect of growth twins. So let me start with the sliding conditions. I'm happy to report that we were able to find, we believe for the first time actually, that we're induced grain refinement in a tribal layer in aluminum. And so uh, I, I'm going to show you uh, how we identify conditions when that happens and how we identify mechanisms of this grain refinement in aluminum. Um, so here is the picture showing TEM of one of our samples before the wear test and after the wear test. And you can see in this region, in the tribal layer here, you have this nanocrystalline uh, microstructure that developed with very small grains. Uh, we characterized the grain size distribution before and after the wear test using uh, transmission electron backscatter diffraction. Uh, and you can see here, here's the cumulative uh, grain size distribution before and after the wear test. Before is the blue one and after wear test is red one. So you can see a significant, significant grain refinement. So let me tell you how we did that and uh, what, uh, what, uh, how we performed the experiment. So we prepared two types of samples. We prepare samples um, through the ARB process where we can prepare samples with different grain sizes and uh, also physical vapor deposition. Uh, and in both cases, we're able to achieve a grain size of about 300 nanometers. It's comparable between these two methods. And then we perform scratch tests when we take a uh, indenter and uh, with a, so we do a single scratch. The radius of curvature is uh, one micron. Uh, it's a diamond tip. And then we do another test where we have diamond tip of a larger uh, radius of curvature, about 100 microns, because we wanted to look at the effects of sliding conditions. After that, because we were primarily interested in microstructural evolution and how to control it, we perform a test when we uh, slid the uh, tip multiple times in the same location in the sample to see how the microstructure changes. And so here uh, we found that there's actually a transition from grain growth to grain refinement as a function of these external conditions. So what I'm showing here is the ARB sample and a PVD sample, they have the same trend. And we organized uh, them in terms of the order of increasing stresses. So we uh, calculated the stress that exists under uh, in the contact using models. I'm not discussing the details of the models here, but they include uh, elastic and plastic deformation. And you can see here that as the contact stress uh, increases, uh, we see a transition from grain growth indicated by these arrows pointing up to uh, no trend and to grain refinement, these arrows pointing down. Um, so uh, theoretically, one would expect that at some very high stresses there, there would be grain refinement, but this is a practical question, whether it's possible to observe it in materials, they have this stacking fold energies in aluminum in particular. Uh, and so we're showing that it is possible under these realistic uh, sliding conditions. And uh, then we also performed, as I mentioned, sliding uh, multiple times at the same location. And here we used stresses that are actually lower than before, about one gigapascal. And we can see that even though the stresses are lower, we can still achieve the grain refinement and, uh, uh, in, these, uh, in these samples. And what it means is that even at lower stresses, it is possible to achieve grain refinement if the deformation rate is high enough. So we introduce defects at high enough rate. So that takes me to the question of mechanisms, what's happening. Um, and so we have analyzed the mechanisms of microstructural evolution uh, at different stages of the deformation after wear test using transmission electron microscopy. Uh, I'm going to show you the schematic overview here. Uh, it's simpler to look at, and I'll show you those examples of TEM. And so the mechanisms underlying the grain refinement in aluminum is uh, that we found this dynamic recrystallization. What well, that means that uh, even if we start with samples that are relatively uh, clean and free of defects, during the formation, we introduce dislocations. Uh, these dislocations lead to strain hardening. And the region where there's a high dislocation density uh, uh, provides potential sites for nucleation of uh, new grains through this dynamic recrystallization process. And so the dislocations organize themselves into subcells and subgrain boundaries and eventually form new grain boundaries. 
And as we continue the deformation, now dislocations can pile up at grain boundaries and also at other microstructural features, like multiple stacking folds that we found in aluminum. And uh, we have high dislocation gradients near these grain boundaries. And these regions have very high energy. And what they do, they recrystallize. So again, this is another type of dynamic recrystallization. And we form this uh, defect-free grains. And they begin to grow. And as they grow, they consume dislocations from the surrounding regions. And eventually, this is a characteristic um, uh, view of this, what these grains look like. You'll see these grains that are near the grain boundary at this location free because they grow and consume these locations. And you continue deforming them inside. So you see these locations inside of them. So this is just an example of a grain like that, uh, where this is a grain boundary in this bright region is a region that's dislocation free. This indicates so the grain boundary is growing, consuming dislocations, and then we're introducing new dislocations inside of this, uh, inside of the grain. So the dark spots here correspond to defects and dislocations. So what about friction and wear in these uh, samples? So I mentioned earlier that in the ARB, ARB process, we can prepare samples with different grain sizes. That also means they have different hardness. So the red color represents different samples that we had. Um, and they had different hardness as shown here. So I plot here coefficient of friction and wear volume as a function of hardness. And if you could look at the red data, it shows that the larger the hardness, the better wear resistance. So that's expected. Harder material has a better wear resistance. But what's surprising is that if you put PVD sample on the same plot as shown in this uh, green circle here, you can see that the PVD sample has the same grain size but it's softer and uh, also, but although it's softer, it has a better wear resistance. So it's sort of counterintuitive that the softer sample would have a better wear resistance and the same pure aluminum, the same grain size. So that really shows that hardness and um, uh, grain size alone are not enough to be able to predict trends in the wear resistance. And it takes me back to my original point to really try to understand what happens during the formation to the microstructure. In this particular case, we have found that there was a different dislocation, evolution of dislocations in these uh, two samples. So in case of the PVD sample, before the wear test, they were relatively dislocation free and the wear introduced increased the density of dislocations. So we have seen really strain hardening from new defects that are introduced. The sample became harder, so it became more wear resistant. In contrast, the ARB sample started with high density of defects uh, there was a severe plastic deformation during synthesis, and this dislocation density decreased by about an order of magnitude from our measurements. So there was a significantly less strain hardening in the ERB sample. So that really it shows that uh, we need to understand the microstructure in its evolution uh, in order to be able to uh, predict wear resistance in design, uh, design materials. So these are the effects of uh, uh, sliding conditions. Now let me talk about more how we can control microstructural evolution through synthesis and design of materials. So next I'll talk about the effects of uh, alloying elements. And now I'll move to uh, talking about our simulation result. Um, we were interested, again, how to suppress the grain growth in aluminum. And uh, one idea is to introduce dopants in the material. And in this case, we introduce zirconium uh, dopants. Uh, because they segregate to grain boundaries as shown here. So we really had this uh, grain boundaries decorated with dopants and uh, uh, aluminum uh, grains. And then we performed simulations, molecular dynamic simulations of sliding, large scale MD with tips. Uh, and then from this, we can measure the friction force, we can measure load, we can measure the wear volume. And uh, what we found is that when we perform just the sliding, so kind of like AFM tip or nano indenter scratch, we found uh, basically that dope samples are harder and they're more wear resistant. So let me show you here. Uh, this shows the wear volume and friction force that's measured under as a function of normal load. Uh, the dope sample is the red color and you can see that it has a lower wear volume and lower friction force. And we can uh, explain and it can be correlated with the hardness of the samples. The dope samples has a higher hardness of 195 gigapascal as compared to 178 for pure sample. So, okay, so maybe that's not surprising, but again, our goal was to understand microstructural evolution. So we perform additional simulations when we take a tip and slide it multiple times over the same location. Uh, and what we found uh, was, uh, it's interesting, it turns out the trends are actually reversed. 
after multiple sliding. And so again, I'm plotting here the wear volume and friction force as a function of normal load. Uh, the red color again is the dope sample. And you can see that this time, uh, the dope sample is either comparable wear or higher than the pure sample and the friction force is higher than the pure sample. So the trend is uh, not the same and it's reversed. And so why is that? Well, it is because there was a significant grain growth in the nano pure nanocrystalline aluminum that we have seen. And this grain growth was suppressed in a doped sample. And so we analyzed the grain growth. Um, this is the uh, cumulative distribution of grain sizes in our sample. And uh, the cumulative distribution can be a little bit challenging to look at at first, but the important region is to focus at this large uh, grain size regime that you can see that uh, blue one is before the wear test and red one is after the wear test. And you can see this emergence appearance of large new grains in the red color in the pure aluminum. And you do not see this effect in, uh, in doped aluminum. So, so we really saw that dope and suppress the grain growth in aluminum. And that led to sort of changes in the wear resistance of these two, uh, these two materials. Now, uh, we analyzed the mechanisms of grain growth and the effects of dopants in detail. Uh, uh, I have limited time here, so I'm not going to discuss them in detail, but, but there's one important message from that. Um, these mechanisms have one thing in common, most of them, is that they are accommodated by dislocation emission from grain boundaries. So let me say it again, that the mechanisms that control the grain growth, they are accommodated by emission of dislocations from grain boundaries. So what the zirconium dopants do here, they suppress dislocation emission from grain boundaries. And you can see that here, uh, this is pure and dope sample. You can see after sliding, the pure sample has twice the dislocation density. And so, uh, but it, what's also interesting about it that we believe that other dopants uh, could have the opposite effect. Uh, so we think that because we have studied in the past nanocrystalline copper, and we saw that uh, the effect where the dopants increase or suppress dislocation emission depends on the type of a dopant that we use. So here is nanocrystalline copper uh, that we studied uh, three years ago. When we doped it with silver, we found the same effect as in aluminum. If we increase the concentration of dopants, it's more difficult to nucleate dislocations. However, Tim Rupert has studied nanocrystalline copper as well, but with zirconium atoms, and he found that higher dopant concentration will make it easier to nucleate this location. We believe the difference comes from whether the dope under the grain boundary, how they affect the free volume, atomic free volume of grain boundary, which is important for nucleation of these locations. But, uh, but the bottom line that is that one could use these dopants and uh, to synthesize materials with a desirable microstructural evolution. And one more important thing is to mention here is that if the dopants suppress dislocation emission, like in the case of zirconium and aluminum, they suppress grain growth, but it will also suppress grain refinement. Uh, I showed you in our earlier, uh, the experimental part of my talk, that grain re refinement occurs through this uh, dynamic recrystallization process, and it relies on dislocations being introduced into the system. So if you suppress dislocation emission, we basically making the grains uh, more stable, but it can be controlled again by the type of a dopant. So I think this is an interesting design principle that we can use. We then asked, uh, is it possible to have, uh, is it an optimum uh, concentration of dopants that are going to maximize strength? And the answer is yes, uh, at least in the case of the uh, materials we looked at. So this time again, this is nanocrystalline copper. It was doped with silver. And we plotted the stress as a function of silver concentration for samples with different grain sizes. And we found that there is a concentration that maximizes uh, the stress, the strength of the alloy. Uh, the reason for that, when we look at the detailed mechanism, is that when we uh, increase the concentration of dopants at grain boundaries, we do two things. One of them, we uh, made it easier for dislocations to slip. And the second thing we do, we also suppress, uh, make it more difficult for grain boundaries to slide. And so there's a transition from the dominant uh, deformation mechanism from grain boundary sliding to dislocation slip. And uh, this is evidence, the evidence is shown here. Uh, these are images from our uh, simulations and the color here represents strain. So the brighter the color, this is where the deformation took place. And the picture on the left-hand side is picture of the low uh, concentration of dopants, you can see the formation is primarily uh, localized at the grain boundaries. At a higher concentration, you can see these dislocations moving 
uh, through the grain. So we see transition for that. And we actually proposed a relationship to describe this transition. Uh, it was published in this paper. And uh, if you look at again at this plot at the top left, uh, the symbols are uh, come from molecular dyna dynamic simulations, but the line come from our analytical model. Um, so there's, a, again, opportunity for design of these materials. Uh, so the last part I wanted to talk about is the effect of uh, growth twins. So again, we're looking at mechanisms to improve wear resistance. And it's known that in metallic systems, uh, twin boundaries can serve a similar role as grain boundaries. They can block dislocations and they can strengthen the material, therefore uh, improve the wear resistance. Uh, this strategy has not been really used in aluminum. Uh, because I, as I mentioned earlier, this material has a high stacking full energy, which means that it's difficult to nucleate twins during deformation. Uh, so this is characteristic of these high stacking full materials. However, in the last few years, it has been shown that these twins can be introduced in aluminum during synthesis. This is a study from Xing, uh, Professor Xing Hang Zhang from Purdue University. So you can see this is an example of nanocrystalline aluminum grains where uh, uh, the twins were introduced during synthesis. So we ask, what is the effect of these twins on wear and microstructural evolution? So we performed, again, molecular dynamic simulations. Grain size is about uh, 20 nanometers. These are the twins. You can see five nan nanometer spacing. And again, we performed simulations of sliding to determine friction and wear volume and microstructural evolution. So um, we have found that the twins, they make the material uh, more wear resistant. And so you can see here, again, friction force and wear as a function of normal load. Uh, the red color is the twin sample. You can see it has a, a lower wear rate than the sample without twins. We have also uh, found that the presence of twins uh, suppresses the uh, grain growth or microstructural evolution. And so again, this is the cumulative grain size uh, in the uh, pure aluminum before and after wear test. And you can see that the appearance of large grains after wear test, this is the red color, new large grains forming. And this effect is, again, missing in the twin aluminum samples. So what is the mechanism of uh, this, uh, uh, why is twin samples stronger and why is the grain uh, microstructural evolution suppressed? So the principle of that is actually similar to what we have seen in the doped samples. It's that twins suppress dislocation emission and dislocation propagation in these aluminum samples. And I think it's quite interesting. So why is it more difficult to nucleate dislocations from grain boundaries when we have twins? Well, it turns out the twins introduce a large plastic anisotropy into the aluminum. So here is a picture of pure uh, aluminum. This is the twin, this is untwinned and twinned. Uh, the tip is at the top, the color represents strain, so basically displacement. You can see the slip lines correspond to maximum uh, resolved uh, shear stress. But in uh, twin samples, this deformation is forbidden. Uh, the slip line cannot cross, dislocations cannot cross easily the twins, so you can see the formation has to proceed along the twin boundaries. So that increases the stress required for nucleation of dislocation. And uh, the dislocations are also more difficult to move. Uh, and we found something that we uh, call coordinated confined layer slip. Confined layer slip has been seen before in multi-layer systems. It's shown here. If we have two, uh, we have a uh, uh, layer, a thin layer, and dislocation is trying to move this yellow line, the ends of the dislocations will be connected to the boundary. And uh, so there's going to be a drag force exerted in the dislocation, uh, making it difficult to move. We have found this confined layer slip in each of these twin layers. And so the blue planes here are the twins, the lines are dislocations. And what we found, they actually connected to each other. And they're connected to each other to minimize uh, the energy. If you look at the twin boundary, the point of connection is just a single point of defect that moves. And what it means that if one dislocation is trying to move, uh, it has to drag together the other dislocations in the neighboring twins. So it makes it more difficult for the dislocation to move. So uh, just I will uh, finish up by saying that um, uh, molecular dynamic simulations are very helpful in identifying mechanisms of microstructural evolution. However, if you want to see uh, the coupling of the different phenomena, let's say long range elastic fields from uh, rough contacts at different length scales, coupled to these local uh, deformation uh, events and microstructural evolution, 
we need to develop uh, multi-scale, multi-physics models uh, to capture that. And I'm um, running out of time, so I'll just say we're developing models like that in our group, uh, but they're really challenging. So I believe this is, uh, uh, it will take contributions from the entire community to develop uh, these kinds of approaches, but I, I believe this is an important area uh, that we need to focus on. So with that, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Isabella? Yes. This is very fascinating talk. I have a question here from uh, Stefan Eder, who asks, what is your approach to differentiate between grain market and locations and processing, so you can statistics. Yeah, I had a hard time hearing you. Would you mind repeating the question, please? Um, Kiara, maybe if I ask it, Isabella, I think I'm not sure if Kiara's connection's a bit a bit bad today. Uh, so Stefanida asks. Sorry. Um, um, oh. What is your approach to differentiating between? Uh, James, would okay. you mind repeating the yeah, question? Yeah, sorry. So it's from Stephanie. Uh, what's your approach to differentiating between grain boundaries and dislocations uh, in your MD post-processing uh, for the large scale MD simulations? Uh, between dislocations, so we use the uh, uh, common neighbor analysis and DXA from Ogita. So they have different uh, medium range orders. So we use a combination of different tools uh, to distinguish dislocations. So we know that aluminum is FCC, so the dislocations will be, uh, uh, they will have HCP structure in their stacking faults, and the grain boundaries are uh, do not have uh, a very well-defined medium range order. So by combination of these different tools, we're able to distinguish them. Thank you. And uh, one more from Alphonse Fisher. Uh, can grain refinement only be brought about by DRX? Uh, what about low stacking fault metals where cross slip and climbing is uh, nearly impossible? And so uh, the, let me just make sure I understand the question. The question is whether there are other mechanisms of grain refinement that are possible in low stacking fault uh, energy metals? I think so, yeah, yeah. I think there, there is. Uh, so uh, we focus on the high stacking full energy metals because there was where the challenge was. This is where it was difficult to agree, achieve grain refinement, but other mechanisms may be possible as well. Okay, I think that's all we have time for for now. Thank you very much, Isabella. Um, so we're now going to have one of our uh, winners, well, the winner from our poster presentations um, a few weeks ago. So Azar, if you could please share your screen. Thank you, James. Are you able to see it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, uh, do I start now? Is it mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, yeah. All yes. right. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Azar. Uh, I'm working with Dr. Ashley Martini at University of California at Merced. Uh, my topic for uh, this presentation is about lubricating mechanisms in space using MOS2 dry film lubricants. Dry film lubricants are primarily used when the operating environment is extreme, such as very high or low temperatures or vacuum conditions and space travel is where we are certain to encounter these situations. MOS2 is one of the most widely used solid lubricants with very low friction behavior, uh, often used in the form of additives in oils or creases or in the form of coatings. The crystal structure of MOS2 takes the form of a hexagonal plane of sulfur atoms on either side of a hexagonal plane of molybdenum atoms. These triple planes stack on top of each other with strong covalent bonds between the molybdenum and sulfur atoms, 
but weak van der Waals forces holding the layers together, which is responsible for the low friction characteristics. Here is an SEM micrograph of our MOS2 coating, which is popularly known as type one structure, uh, where you can see the MOS2 tiny crystallites oriented perpendicular to the substrate. So what's the problem with using MOS2 as a dry fin lubricant in space? So components that are sent to space with dry film lubricants first have to be tested in earth ambient conditions. Ambient conditions include oxygen and humidity, which have been known to be detrimental to the coating life. So how do we address this? One, we can add dopants such as nickel, which have been found to counter the degrading effects of oxygen and humidity by either increasing hardness are improving oxidation resistance of MOS2. Then quantify the coating performance improvement in nickel dope coating using tribological experiments. To do this, we perform tribo testing using unidirectional ball on disc tests on both undoped and nickel dope specimen. We quantify the coating life by long duration testing in terms of number of cycles to failure which is indirectly determined by spike in coefficient of friction above 0.4. These tests were carried out at contact pressures ranging from 300 to 1100 megapascals. Note that the speed also changes with pressure to resemble the stress speed conditions of gearing systems. In this case, uh, our lab air relative humidity range from around 37 to 52%. The average coating life from three tests was plotted against the contact pressures here. We found that nickel dope, nickel dope coating outperformed the undoped MOS2 coating, especially at low pressures. As expected, the coating life is lower at higher pressures. However, we saw greater variability in nickel dope coating life, possibly due to uneven nickel distribution across the coating surface. This work is a necessary first step before determining the life in vacuum environments to assess how much useful coating life will be left after testing on earth before sending the components into space. To conclude my presentation, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues at UC Merced and JPL for this work and thanks to West for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Azar. Uh, congratulations on uh, winning the poster competition. Um, so now we have our, you. if you could, uh, yeah, turn off your video and mute. And um, now we have our final speaker, um, Arban Jasufi from ExxonMobil. Um, Arban, if you could turn on your video and share screen, please. Yes, um, just a sec. Can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, all good. Wonderful. Uh, uh, thank you, Chiara and, and James, for inviting me to this uh, web seminar series. Um, uh, and thank you for putting this together. I really enjoyed all the previous talks um, and learned a lot. Uh, um, I'm at ExxonMobil. I'm in the corporate research lab in New Jersey um, and uh, would like also to thank my uh, colleagues um, that are listed here uh, who carried out the important experimental um, parts and components of this of this project. Um, I'm myself, I'm a modeling person and I will um, talk today about how we can predict um, friction modifier adsorption on, 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 on solid surfaces using uh, molecular modeling tools. Um, and the motivation why we are working on this is that uh, OEMs such as uh, car manufacturers, they, they set more and more ambitious targets for friction reduction to increase uh, fuel economy. Um, for lubricant producers uh, like our company, um, it is essential to understand how the various additives actually inter interact with the various uh, surfaces, particularly when they are coated. And here's just an example um, of, uh, in, on this chart, what you can see are uh, friction coefficient um, measurements uh, that are published in this work uh, cited here. Um, 
with and without a friction modifier, which in this case is a molybdenum containing friction modifier and uh, the, the moly trimer that is shown on the right, uh, the chemical compound and the structure. And there are different types of DLC. And what I mean by that, there could be, it doesn't really matter for the purpose of this talk. It's, if you want to know more details, it's in, in this paper, but some of them are borated DLC um, and, and uh, car manufacturers um, are looking into all kinds of, of, of diamond-like carbon compositions. So you can vary the materials properties of uh, DLC by, for example, uh, dope them, using different sp2 to sp3 ratios, hydrogenate them. So there are all kinds of ways to, to manipulate um, the coating materials. And you could imagine that if each car manufacturer uses its own coating material for the lubricant produced, to sure that the additives that we are using are compatible in our formulations with those coating materials. So understanding the friction mechanisms becomes increasingly important, even though it's such an such an old question and we, and, and we have been working on this and we have heard all these nice talks um, during this web seminar series that there are still a lot of challenges and exciting um, research going on. Um, let me give you a high level view of what I mean by the friction mechanism and where this work that I'm going to show you today fits in and, where, and how it is tied to the other components of the friction mechanism process. So in the very simplified fashion, so what, it, what is drawn here schematically is a substrate that is that may be coated with uh, DLC or some other coating materials. And typically the coating materials are in the range of several uh, micrometers. And that surface is in contact um, with a lubricant that contains various additives. And I highlight here only the friction modifiers, but there are like many other additives in, in, in the formulation. And some of them are also surface active, by the way. So it is um, important, the first step for um, the friction modifier in this process is to get adsorption on the surface. And then the second step is uh, if you have now a counter surface, um, it could be in an, an experiment, uh, could be also just an AFM tip, but of course in, in an engine, so you have a counter surface that, is, that may also be coated or not. Uh, is, is rubbing over, over the, the, the bottom surface here and with the additives and lubricant in, in between. And we have seen uh, that tribochemical processes are taking place in, that, in, the, in, this, in this regime here. And you get tribofilm formation. And we have heard several nice talks about uh, these processes. It is very exciting, and, but also very complex processes going on. And, and it's an active area of research very challenging um, problems here to, to tie everything back to, um, to what we observe experimentally and how that actually result in, in friction performance or for that matter related to it in wear performance. The focus of this talk is really just on this absorption process. And I would like to show you uh, that our um, modeling methodology to predict um, how much material gets actually absorbed. So for example, if you would then want to study tribochemical tribo processes using some other modeling tools like DFT or up initio calculations or reactive MD calculations, that you have an idea how much molecules are actually on the surface and how close they are packed together. So this is an old question, um, how, many, how many molecules are actually covering the surface and I'm, I'm I'm showing here a very um, uh, uh, old chart, old meaning like it's 30, m over 30 years ago, that actually colleagues that worked in, in our corporate research lab, um, who have, they retired way before I joined the company, Jan Mir and Belza, they published this paper on friction coefficient uh, measurements um, as a function of concentration. And what they, what they saw is what was observed is that after you increase the concentration, uh, the friction coefficient levels off. So adding more and more additive, in this case, these are organic uh, friction modifiers, um, they didn't see any improvement. And in this paper, they also um, looked into, tried to calculate what is the free energy of adsorption actually of these various organic friction modifiers. And they, they came up with a model to relate um, the coverage uh, that they assumed to be a highly dense layer as soon as you have this um, leveling off uh, feature of the friction coefficient. So it's so they assume when the friction coefficient levels off, at that point there's no more um, 
friction modifier adsorption taking place, and we have the highest adsorption limit reached. But what does this highest adsorption limit mean, actually? Is it like 100% population of the surface or not? Um, this question, um, and if you look into simulation, so this is uh, uh, actually a paper by James, um, who published this paper a few years ago, um, where they actually varied not the bulk concentration, but they varied the um, surface coverage of uh, organic friction modifiers. And you can see gamma is the uh, surface concentration molecules per square nanometers, and mu is the friction coefficient. And I think they did this on, on iron oxide. Um, and you see that as you increase the coverage, so you go from right to left, uh, you see it, the, the, it gets much, much denser. But then to the highest one, you see a phase transition from a disordered phase of the friction modifiers um, to a highly ordered uh, lamellar phase. Okay, so you get you get you get a phase transition here, but you have to go to really high um, uh, surface uh, uh, concentrations, and you see, and they also observe that you get actually an additional boost um, or improvement in the friction coefficient of of twenty or thirty percent. So you could ask the question, even though so there, the friction coefficient that are shown here are not comparable to the one that are calculated in MD because they, they in, in in uh, the experiment, they actually used a copper surface. But you can ask the question, if you would increase this further, does it, or wait maybe long, a long time, maybe you, you have this phase transition um, also to a crystalline uh, layer. So what does this actually mean when you have a full surface coverage that was assumed in this paper by Jan Muir and Belzer? And how important it is for friction performance? In order to answer this question um, through modeling approach, I would like to um, mention there that the, the challenge that is there if you do atomistic simulations and you wanna link now, because now in order to answer that question, you need to link actually the bulk concentration that is the control parameter in the experiments to the surface concentration that typically is a control parameter in molecular dynamic simulations. So the link between those two concentrations, surface and bulk concentration is you need to know what the partitioning is. Now, if you have a very high surface active um, uh, compound in your, in your lubricant, and this is, so you have some base stock and some additives, and if the additive is highly surface active, as soon as you add molecules here, they get readily absorbed. So to get the true partitioning, so what happens, the true thermodynamic equilibrium, you need to observe absorption and desorption process. And you need to have a sufficiently high bulk region to, to capture the bulk region and also the surface region, which is uh, everyone who does MD, that means that you need to have a sufficiently big system size. You need to run the simulations very long, particularly if you have surfactants or surface active compounds, or here those friction modifiers that are a very surface active, so then you have a very low concentration, you are mainly actually simulating the base stock molecules. So the solvent instead of the additives that you are really interested in. So we tried to come up with an idea to actually come up to, to, to develop uh, an efficient uh, modeling approach that allows you, it's not a quick calculation, but it, it, it is a, a more computationally feasible calculation to do particularly if you want to run a lot of screenings. Also, you can uh, extend this method to um, mixtures of different surface active compounds. So if you have uh, more than just one component, you can actually um, e expand it to, to mixtures. And we have shown this in another work um, uh, when it comes to uh, surfactant adsorption. We have not shown it here um, for friction modifiers, but um, for surfactant adsorption at fluid-fluid interfaces, this works pretty well. Um, so those ideas uh, came actually originally from uh, um, a thermodynamic framework, molecular thermodynamic framework. So people like Professor Blankstein at MIT has developed uh, this framework for fluid-fluid interfaces. Um, and others um, have developed these, these theoretical frameworks. And we combined it here with uh, MD simulations, molecular dynamic simulations, to get the equilibrium partitioning between friction modifier bulk concentration and the surface concentration. And the, the idea is as follows. In the bulk, um, you typically, in most applications that we have, you the concentration is relatively low of the surfactant, of the, I, I, I keep saying surfactants, I uh, should say friction modifiers. 
the idea is, is coming from surfactant. I'm actually coming from from uh, from the complex fluids, and I worked a lot on surfactants. I'm actually not a tribologist, so. Um, but the idea is, is here the same. So you have your friction modifier that is dissolved in, in oil. Um, and as long as the friction modifiers in the bulk don't see each other, you can write in the chemical potential is mainly driven by, uh, by the entropic contribution. So X is just a mole fraction of the friction modifier. And this is the standard chemical potential um, in the bulk. So B stands for the bulk. On the surface or in the interface side, as you, you have your chemical potential, si sigma, sigma just indicates the surface, you again have a, now a different uh, standard chemical potential. Now the next term is again an entropic part, but this is now on 2D, so you can consider this as a 2D um, surface concentration. So gamma is again the, the, the um, surface concentration, A is a molecular area. And then you have, which I'm not going to go into detail, with, a, with this, what I call here, and I stands for a non-ideal contributions to the chemical potential that will depend also explicitly on the surface concentration, gamma. Those uh, terms, there are additional terms there that mainly account for as you populate for interactions among the friction, absorbent friction modifiers as you populate the surface. Okay, in the bulk, it's very dilute. The friction modifiers don't see each other. But on the surface, they see each other. So you have to account for non-ideal contributions in the chemical potential. At thermodynamic equilibrium, those two chemical potentials should be the same. Now, in this theory, we have different uh, parameters that go in. One is indicated here is the molecular size. We can calculate that for, for the friction modifiers. And the other important one, and there are a few others, the other important one, though, that I would like to mention is the uh, free energy of absorption. And that goes into the equilibrium constant K. So that goes into the exponent here. So this is basically the difference between uh, the chemical potential sigma 0 of an, at infinite dilution, that difference to the difference uh, to, to the chemical potential in the bulk at infinite dilution. So it's really this mu sigma zero minus mu beta zero. This gives you the free energy of absorption of, a, of the additive at infinite dilution in the bulk and at infinite dilution in, on the surface. As you populate the surface, you get the other contributions due to interactions on the surface. That is captured here in mu sigma and i. Um, and we have uh, terms, you can use equation of states. That, that's what we did was we, we viewed the, the, the molecules absorbed on the surface um, as hard disks. And you can use the equation of hard disk, state of um, hard disks to estimate that contribution. And there, there's another term there that accounts for entro entropic penalty that you have as you populate the surface because you have a specific orientation. So you, that there's an entropic cost that you don't have this free rotation anymore uh, on your surface. So the, and if you know, want to know details in our paper, we, you, you can you can see them uh, there the the various contributions. Of course, you can you can uh, send me your questions and, and I can elaborate more on this on this question. Let me just mention how we calculate the free energy of absorption uh, delta G zero. So you can do that um, uh, uh, using now molecular dynamic simulations using free energy methods, and that's shown here on on this slide. Here's the free energy as a function of your of the molecule Z, uh, which is the distance between the, the friction modifier and your surface. In this case, uh, this is magnetite, Fe304. Um, and as you bring the molecule closer and closer to the surface, you see some, some variations um, of the free energy, actually a little penalties here compared to the bulk value. In the bulk, it does not change much, but then you see the surface effects. And these oscillations are coming from the solvent. So in this case, it's heptane. You actually have some layering. And in fact, these, these oscillations can be quite significant for different types of, of base stocks. But once those barriers are overcome, if you bring it into contact, you see a significant free energy decrease. And if you take the um, Boltzmann weighted average, you get a value of around uh, minus 26.4 kilojoules per mole, which is about you know, 10 to 12 um, KTs. And uh, the drive, main driving, just to mention this, is there are specific interactions here between 
the hydrogens and the oxygens, the iron, the various irons, actually, the Fe, um, of the different oxidation states of iron 2 plus, iron um, 3 plus, and the oxygens on the surface. But this is all, I would like to say, this is all physical adsorption. So the molecule can, in principle, hop around um, on the surface. It does not occur very often, but it, it can happen. So they are not chemically bonded um, to, this, to this surface. Now, now that we have the delta G of adsorption, we can now um, feed it into our molecular thermodynamic um, theory and calculate now this ratio here, gamma A over XV. A is also calculated um, through simulations. And then we can predict now, this is the red line on this chart, the amount of um, additive adsorption, which is here in mass nanograms per square centimeters on the y-axis. And the x-axis uh, actually shows the so-called monomer mole fraction, which is uh, because when we need, to, we need to take into account dimerization of uh, steric acid in the bulk. So actually steric acid forms a non-negligible amount of dimers in the bulk and they absorb as well. Um, and this, what I show you is just the monomer portion of it. So, so we accounted for that effect as well. And this is now in comparison shown to uh, so-called powder experiments in which we, you use uh, micrometer sized um, iron oxide powders uh, that is um, in contact or that you put into a solution of, of your base stock with, it was in heptane and uh, with, with steric acid. And you measure with IR spectroscopy, you measure before you dip it in what the concentration is of your uh, friction modifier and after the adsorption takes place. So these are precise uh, measurements, uh, but there are some uncertainty um, uh, related to this in the powder experiment. So that's why you see actually um, some discrepancies that to an independent, uh, a different um, methodology in which the um, adsorption was measured, namely QCM, which stands for quartz crystal microbalance, uh, a different method. Um, and there are discrepancies between these two. And we try to elaborate an, in our paper where these discrepancies come from. But interestingly, the, the theory, the MD, MTT, which stands for molecular dynamics, uh, molecular thermodynamic theory, it's actually predicting, it's more or less almost like a compromise between these two um, experimental data. Um, there are surface, ef surface effects here. So the, it could be that the powder and the powder experiments, we have actually different surface orientations of the magnetite. And here we, I just wanna show, we, we calculated that if you have different surface orientations, uh, that indeed there is a difference in the free energy of absorption of the, of, of, of the steric acid. But the overall free energy of adsorption, the delta G values from QCM, from powder and MD, powder seems to deviate the most from the MD calculation. QCM is actually quite close to, to, to the MD calculations. Now this curve, the red curve keeps increasing. And what is the actual limitation? When you look at the experimental data, powder stops somewhere here at around 150 uh, nanograms uh, per square centimeter. Uh, whereas the, the, the QCM stops also, actually the last data point shown here is also around the same value. Um, and if you actually, we found an interesting correlation, if you use a random sequential adsorption model, uh, this is a very simple model actually, but people have done you know, quite laborious Monte Carlo calculations to calculate um, how much disks you can populate on a surface and they can move around and you get empty space, so eta, eta is the packing fraction. The white space is where you can, set, where can, you, you can place additional or subsequent disks on, on your surface. As you, of course, increase the packing fraction, the, the, the possibilities of adding more becomes more and more difficult. Like when you try to, to, to park a car in a very crowded uh, parking lot, then not only one car has to move, but a lot of cars have to move. So it, has, it requires a collaborative uh, motion of the al already absorbed molecules or disks in this case uh, to to make more space for subsequent absorption, and people have uh, have have calculated there is a the limiting packing fraction for this process which is around 55 percent. They calculated actually to to even more higher decimals than this, and with this this number here is actually much lower than what is theoretically possible with disks, which is 91 percent. Now, if we take 
you can calculate A is again the molecular area. Let's assume now that a similar mechanism takes place here, that our steric acid um, head group, the polar region, we calculate the effective area of that region. And we did that, and it's about 0.17 square nanometers. And if you then use that 55% as your maximum packing fraction, you can get actually what your maximum surface coverage is. And this is the, the dashed so, uh, blue line. So it's really interesting to see that the experimental data points actually somewhere end up near there. It's, it's strikingly close. Um, so the crystalline steric acid packing, we think, is actually not formed, at least not during this measurement. So maybe if you wait a long time, and there are actually reports in literature that we cited in our paper uh, where, uh, they, where other authors have seen that um, subsequent adsorption, actually, there's, there seems to be a, a, a barrier to get more adsorption, and you have to wait significantly longer, in like a week or two, to, to get like a more higher uh, population of, of your friction modifier on the surface um, to, to, to get the crystalline packing. So it's thermodynamically possible, but in pr on practical time scales, it may be not so relevant. So just briefly to close, since I'm running out of time, we expanded, uh, so for we use steric, I know that steric acid is not like um, the most the, the, uh, novel friction modifier, but just for the methodology development, it's a very useful tool, a uh, useful compound. So exp we expanded the methodology to molybdenum containing friction modifiers that we also recently published. We, we looked into molybdenum dithiocarbamate and dithiophosphate, and we found um, actually good agreement, at least for the moly uh, DTC. For the moly DTP, which I highlight here, actually the, ex or the experimental data, so again, you have adsorption versus bulk mole fraction. The experimental data show that you get a minute concentration of moly DTP, like 10 to the power of minus seven. You get um, adsorption, but in combination with uh, the theory and also the RSA, the random sequential adsorption model that predicts 228, we think based on that, we think that all these, these um, this adsorbed material is actually multi-layer adsorption and you can apply actually um, a BET fit um, to, to account for that. And we calculated again, the free energy of adsorption. So this is the prediction of for moly, moly DTP. Moly DTC actually doesn't show that that behavior, and I would like to mention this This was done on a diamond-like carbon, borated diamond-like carbon, which is actually quite important that it's borated, um, and it's also quite important. We also found that organic friction modifiers only show very weak adsorption on this material, whereas the molyb molybdenum-containing one, at least for the borated one, show significant adsorption. But there are differences between moly DTP and moly DTC. In summary, I hope that I showed you um, a methodology that allows you to predict adsorption isotherms. Um, this was all pure predictions, all done on a computer using molecular dynamic and the molecular thermodynamic uh, theory framework that actually is coming from the surf surfactant research area that we applied here for friction modifiers. Um, that jamming actually can be a very limiting factor. Maybe chemisorption may help to overcome uh, jamming, um, but on practical timescales, if you are dealing with physical adsorption, uh, you need, uh, we believe that uh, jamming uh, plays a major role here um, regarding the population of your surface. That allows you also, if you now run uh, subsequent simulations to study now tribochemical processes, you get an idea of how many molecules you need actually to bring together on your surface to, 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 to do those calculations, to run those calculations. And we applied this on molecule containing friction modifiers. And just finally to mention, now, this is just on what I showed you today was really focused on adsorption, but combining it perhaps with modeling that can study the mechanochemical processes. And we collaborate here with Professor Martini um, and her group. Uh, we have collaborated to, to study actually the moly disulfide uh, formation. Um, if you combine those, it can perhaps become one day um, uh, hopefully a useful tool to, to study you know, the broader process of the friction. Uh, modify uh, friction uh, reduction process. And with this, I would like to thank uh, thank everyone, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Arben. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, Chiara, is your internet okay now, or do you want me to ask the questions again?
Let's try. <laughs> Let's okay. try. So uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk. Um, Fang Lu asked, what is the critical value of surface coverage for the phase change? Do you see the phase change on samples other than the um, uh, FE304? So for the phase change here, when I actually go to, to James' uh, snapshot here from his paper, the phase change occurs somewhere between these two. Uh, so this is like 2.88 per square nanometer. This is 4.3. Um, I th it, it is slightly below this value, but with a jamming that is like 55%, it is somewhere in between this here. It's a little lower than the phase change uh, transition concentration that you need. And I think there was a second part in the question. Yes, so do you see the phase change on samples other than the FE304? No, we have not seen that experimentally. We have not seen that experiment, uh, experimentally, and I did not uh, run simulations at this high concentration, but there are papers on that. So James' papers, but there are also other authors who looked into this. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then Carlos Sayesteran asked, how would stronger adsorption energy uh, for the OFMs and iron oxide affect the predicted adsorption isotherm? How strong the... So if you change the absorption energy between the friction modifiers and the iron oxide surface yes. and make it stronger, uh, can you tell how that would change the predicted absorption isotherm? Oh, so the, the main driving force is the delta G of, of, of um, the absorption. So since it goes into an exponent, it has significant changes, right? So when you go here, you see this, this delta G of uh, the free energy of absorption um, is in the exponent of for the equilibrium constant calculation. So changes here significantly impact the adsorption isotherm because it goes into, into an exponent. And that's actually the reason when you look here, when you compare steric acid, which has, here we are looking into mole fractions of 10 to the power of minus four or five. And the other example, I know it's a different surface, but it shows you if you change the delta G, how much of an effect. So here we are talking about, this is a logarithmic scale here on the x-axis. So, so the, the, the free energy here is 63, minus 63 kilojoules per mole. That has a significant effect on the absorption as a therm. Okay, thank By you. orders of magnitudes. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's all the questions we have time for now, and I'll pass it on back to James. Thank you. Uh, th yeah, so I'd just like to thank uh, all of our speakers from the whole series. We've had uh, a really great response, both from our speakers, from our poster competition, um, and also everyone watching, um, mostly at home, I guess, and also some people may be back in the office now. Um, as I say, we do plan to be back in 2021 uh, for another series. Uh, we're not sure what time of year that'll be yet, but we'll keep you posted, uh, everybody on the mailing list, as to when uh, when we're planning our next series. Um, just thanks to our sponsors again, the Royal Society of Chemistry, Swiss Stribology, Institute of Physics and the Institution of Mechanical Engineers. Um, if you have any uh, comments or recommendations on what we could do better next time, um, we'd really appreciate it. So we'll be sending around a survey in the next uh, few days. Um, we'd really appreciate getting some of your kind of ideas um, for the next time. Um, but yeah, just like to thank everybody involved. Uh, it's been a real success. Uh, thanks to Chiara. And uh, yeah, hopefully see you again soon. Thanks everyone, bye.